You know, I, I feel like now I'm, 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 I'm sorry that it's me. I feel like I'm at a revival. <laughs> I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of um, Mira Turner, and it's so funny. I had no idea Kalia was even going to be here today, and I watch her videos on YouTube, and she's a huge inspiration. So thank you for for indulging me and listening to me for the next you know, couple of minutes. So just so you know, I'm Elaine Turner and I own a fashion retail business here based in Houston. Um, you know, I've been doing it for about 18 years and like many of you out there, I hold many roles in my life. I'm a you know, mother, I'm a wife, I'm a sister, I'm a friend, I'm a business owner. But really when I let those labels, when I shed those labels, I'm ultimately a lover of people and especially women. So I'm just so honored to be here today because when she talked to me and she's been so loyal and so wonderful to me and rooting me on uh, throughout my career, I knew that I couldn't pass this up because I feel like there's a connection with us all. All of us hold all of these labels and it's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is the complexities of being a woman today in the 21st century and what that brings. And so I just recently wrote a book called um, Breaking the Glass Slipper, Debunking the Myths That Hold Women Back. And um, I kind of just wanted you guys to kind of indulge me a little bit and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the book and kind of why I wrote it. It ultimately started really, it was a healing journey. I wrote the book. Um, I started thinking about the journey I had been on with my daughter, Marley, who's now 14. And when I initially started writing, it was, it was out of, like I said, therapeutic almost for me. And I was writing about my journey with her and she has special needs. She was born with a genetic abnormality. And about three or four years ago, we found out this diagnosis. And so writing became a huge form of healing for me. But something happened, you know, I don't know how to phrase it, if you want to say aha moment or a God moment. Um, I was in Dallas at one of my stores, and I met a woman in Dallas who sort of shifted my course with the book. I had thought it would be very, very much of a personal journey with my daughter Marley, which that still might happen for anyone who has special needs relatives or kids. Um, but when I met this woman, I realized that I wanted my first book to really be about women and what we go through as women. And I was in Dallas and I had a TV segment that morning and I was talking about my latest collection um, that was inspired by Havana, Cuba. And it was full of color and had all these caftan silhouettes that fit all types of body types. And this woman um, came to see me at the store and said, I saw you on TV this morning and I wanted to introduce myself. And she told me her name and she said, I'm terminally ill and I only have a couple of months to live. I've been diagnosed with multiple myeloma and they've done everything they can and I'm probably not gonna be here much longer and I just want to tell you, and she drove 25 miles to tell me this. She said, what I saw you on TV and I saw the colors and the silhouettes and things you were designing, it gave me hope. And she said, don't ever underestimate what you do. And she grabbed my shoulders and said that to me and in that moment, I had this realization that I had underestimated what I do. I think I had attached myself to this idea that somehow maybe fashion wasn't really enough. And I don't, I, I don't know where that sort of deep in the crevices of my soul, I think when she said that to me, it allowed me to open up to this idea of, okay, what else have I attached myself to that is no longer serving me? And so, I wanted to, that sort of led me down this exploration of these myths, these lies, these things that we're told as women that are untrue. And so the first one that you know I wanted to talk to you about was inspired by this woman, the fashion is frivolous myth. And even though I thought I'd obviously, I don't think I was even cognizant of how I felt about that, she let me understand that maybe I underestimated the power of fashion. So I walk through in this chapter about how fashion is ultimately transformative. You know, fashion is a visual, it's your visual language to the world. And I think so many of us get caught up today into what we see in social media, 
what we're, you know, sold as, oh, well, fashion's not important, or, you know, you kind of think about it as it's for a certain body type, or it's for a certain person with a certain amount of money, but really it has nothing to do with any of that. You know, fashion has nothing to do really with the clothes that you buy, or, you know, wearing a Cartier watch, or anything like that. Fashion has to do, I think, with fearlessness, and freedom, and freedom to express yourself. And I always like to coin it as, you know, when I'm in one of my stores and I see someone try something on and she says to me, oh, I'm not into fashion. I would never wear something like that. And then she'll try on something like a caftan dress. And then all of a sudden she'll look at me and say, I had no idea I could become this. So I think that fashion is much deeper than I think people want to recognize. Obviously, use responsibly. Um, it can be a gateway <laughs> toward, you know, don't go spend $2,500 on dress today. But, you know, fashion is a gateway to seeing yourself in a new way. The next chapter I talk about is the Cinderella myth, which, you know, we all know the story. It's the perfect girl with the perfect man and the perfect dress. And then she fits seamlessly into the perfectly molded glass slipper. And really, this chapter is sort of the metaphor of the, of the title of my book. I also make shoes. And so, you know, I thought that was clever, breaking the glass slipper. <laughs> but, um, and, you know, we have something in common here with this she said, she led, she is, is that hot pink is like what we're all. I know now I'm kind of like ashamed that I'm not wearing my hot pink, but my brand colors are hot pink. So anyway, with Cinderella, we all know the story. And my, you know, as I walk through this chapter, my uh, what I'm trying to convey and communicate through this is saying, look, nobody out there can tell you what their idea of like perfectionism is, or nobody should be able to allow you to feel like you need to fit into some limited idea of being perfect. You know the truth of who you are, and you know that you own your own perfect you. Imperfect, I like to call it the, you know, and perfectly perfect you. So I walk through what that means, that none of us have to feel like that we need to own or you know, take on or attach, I like the word attach, to somebody else's idea of perfectionism. And then I go through the next chapter is, you know, we've all been there that we feel like other women must be our rivals. And we know that to be untrue. And like Mayor Turner said, there's no other time more important than today that we as women come together. You know, for whatever reasons, I, I walk through this in the book, that we might feel like that we are against each other, whether it's a feeling of scarcity. You know, we mentioned a lot, if we feel like there's not enough room at the boardroom table for me, or whether it's feeling that, you know, a scarcity around romantic relationships. You know, women vying for, for, for the ideal, right? I think that what we have to understand is that we all know this to be true in this room today, that the most profound love stories in our lives are most often with our female friendships and mentors. And so I'm a huge, huge believer in that women who work together succeed together. The next chapter I talk about is vulnerability equals weakness. And really, vulnerability is the thread that runs through my whole book, that you'll see it in all the chapters and everything that I'm talking about is that it's okay to have wounds. It's okay to have challenges. It's okay to fail or perceive yourself to have failed. We'll get into that in a minute. But what I'm trying to say is through those wounds and through those challenges, when the light shines in on those cracks, is you know, my my belief is that it's, it's divinity ultimately shining in and saying, you know what, through all of this, if we share and we come together, we come out stronger. And so I'm here to talk to you guys about don't shy away from what's real in your life. I think so many people try to compartmentalize and create barriers around this sort of idealized state. And I think as women, we'll go stronger together to break all those barriers down and say, you know what, let me tell you what I've been through. And then people will cross me and say, I've been there too. And guess what? You've got two women who've multiplied in strength. The last myth I talk about, well, not the last, I'm going to talk, that's, this is my fifth myth, is our failures define us. And I just mentioned failures. We all feel like sometimes that we fail. That's just the reality of life. But I don't believe in failure. I don't believe in the word. So I like to call it perceived failure. So no matter what you feel like in your life that has come at you that you haven't felt like that you've been able to overcome, or it could be just a perception that you hold deep inside, like I just mentioned, even fashion, not so sure, is that really worthy? Is that really enough? 
And right now, I feel like I'm going through my own experience with failure. And what failure means is our, our industry is changing rapidly. And I've had to really look at my, my company and transform it from moving away from a brick and mortar retail business to more of a digital business. And I can't deny that when we have to close a store, I feel like I've failed. And I've had to really look at that through new eyes and through a new lens and say to myself, but all this ultimately is, is a gateway towards the truth. It's a gateway giving me more information to allow me to transform into something even better. Something that maybe I didn't even know was real. But what happens is we all get stuck looking at the closed doors in front of us instead of looking at the one that's creaking open beside us. So the one myth, the last myth that I wanted to kind of, you know, conclude my speech with is the myth of having it all. You know, I, I felt like when I heard who I was talking to today, you know, business owners, leaders in the community, aspiring entrepreneurs, I realized that I really, I wanted to connect with you guys and kind of the misnomer that this myth can lead us to, which I know so often we hear these credos of like having it all and work-life balance and we're kind of thinking to ourselves, well, what, what exactly does that mean and how do I fit into that? And so I wanted to kind of dissect that with you guys and, and, and not be afraid of what it means. I feel like just to give you a quick history, you know, Helen Gurley Brown coined um, Having It All in the early 60s, and she was the late editor-in-chief of Cosmopolitan Magazine, and her definition of it was extremely singular. It was, you're married, you have kids, and you have a career. Well, as we all know in today's world, whatever that is, 40 years later, wherever we are, 35 years later, that that's, that's really, you cannot universally define a credo like Having It All. And I think that what, what happened when that, that was defined that way is that many women got caught up into this sort of no-win scenario of like, if I'm not filling these buckets 100%, then somehow I'm failing, right? And so it was like a cobweb of like, well, wait, why? I mean, I'm not 100% at work and I don't feel like I'm doing the mom thing right in my marriage. But ultimately, having it all means something different to everyone. And so we have to look at it in a more customized way and understand that not all of us are going to have the same dreams of, you know, being a mother or working or, or being married. You know, all of us are going to have our own unique customized dreams. So I propose in the book kind of looking at it differently. And I'm a huge believer in reframing the way that we see things because I believe some of these credos cause anxiety in us. Like, oh my gosh, do I, I don't know if I have it all. I don't feel like I'm having it all. So I say, hey, how about we reframe that from a one-size-fits-all model, which we know never works. I mean, it doesn't work on clothing either, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, we can't say that to a what works for you model. And so I go through that and what that means is let's let go of this idea that we all have to assume that we all want and dream the same things in life. And then the next thing I talk about, again, back to these, these ideologies that were sold, you know, a lot of what I'm talking about is what we're programmed and sold as women is this idea of leaning in, which I'm a huge Sheryl Sandberg fan. I read the book, I love her. But I think what's important to point out, and maybe what I feel like I want to point out, is that it's also okay sometimes if you have to lean back. That doesn't mean you're giving up. I think sometimes we preach to women like, you got to say more and do more and be louder. And if you're not, you're not enough. You're not doing enough. But sometimes I like to think of life a little bit as a chess game. You know, sometimes in life you take two steps forward. Sometimes in life you take a lateral move based on what's happening with your health, what's happening with your child, what's what happening with the relationship. Sometimes you have to take a step back. And that's okay because anything that you might perceive as a plateau or maybe not just, you know, life isn't just a staircase up to the success at all costs, you know, but that's not the way life is. Life is a maze, right? So life is a jungle gym. So we all have to let go of this idea that somehow if we're not leaning in enough or we're not screaming loud enough, then we're failing because that's not true. And then again, another one, the work-life balance credo. I, you know, this one's a little bit harder for me. You know, work versus life, just the way it's written, it feels a little disconnected to me. I feel like that you have life 
and you know you have this holistic picture of life and work is a part of that. And so I talk about in this whole idea of work-life balance is let's also recoin that. Let's, let's rephrase what that means. Let's say it's work-life integration. Let's not say it's work versus life. And again, the whole balance word, you know, that's a real popular word right now. You know, what does that mean? What do you mean balance? And I think that you know, I have this in the, in the book, is maybe it's not about balance at all. Maybe it's about simplifying, making better choices and creating clearer boundaries. You know, in your life, you can sit there and say, am I balanced? Well, think about your life for a minute. Think about when you, you know, if any of you are a mother, when you had a baby, did, did you feel like you were balanced? <laughs> I mean, you know, I was just like spit up, pacifier, spit up, pacifier. I didn't know anything about Lane Turner designs. You know, I mean, I was, but think about when maybe you started, she said she led, she is, or when you got that first job, or when you knew that you were going to be put on this committee, that, and were you, were you balanced then? No. So I think that balance is also one of those dangerous words that we feel like we've got to fit into all of these things that we're told. And ultimately, you know, if you're imbalanced, I think that you, you know, I look at it as like sometimes when we're imbalanced is when we're progressing the most in life, you know, when we are pushing forward, like I, I, humanity is pushing forward, you know. And so I think sometimes we got to let that go that we have to be perfectly balanced, work-life balance, you know, lean in and having it all. And so ultimately, what does all this do? What do all of these things that we're sold and we're told do? You know, as much as we feel guilty about it and sometimes we wish it wasn't true, it feels like pressure. You know, people don't want to admit it, but sometimes all these possible possibilities and all these choices create a pressure and a stress inside of us and that's okay it's okay to admit the complexity of of what we're going through as women today and it doesn't mean we're not grateful for all the women before us who set us up for all of these incredible choices but the reality is today as a woman and i know i feel it sometimes i don't know what to choose and it causes an internal sense of anxiety and so what i wanted to leave you with today is okay how can we rid ourselves of feeling that anxiety you know how can we look at it a little bit different and not feel like in some ways we're not enough that we're not matching up so i walk through some of the things that i try to practice in my uh, in my own life which is the first one is just let go and simplify. And I know a, probably a lot of y'all are thinking, oh, she means just, you know, let go and clean out your closet. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, which I think those things are good, and I'm a huge believer in the, you know, minimalism and simplifying your life. But really when I talk about let go, you guys, I'm talking about let go of the things that your psyche holds onto that no longer serves you. Shed those unrealistic expectations of yourself and anything that you've attached yourself to that you know brings you down. So whether it was something you were told as a child, whether it was something, you know, maybe I was told along the way that maybe fashion wasn't a worthy vocation. You know, maybe you were told that you didn't have the right body type. I mean, I don't know what it is for you, but let go of that. That is what I mean when I say let go and simplify. Allow yourself to let go and reframe the way that you see things. That's so important as us as women to, to start feeling like that we are enough because we are. Another one I talk about is celebrating this, oh no, live in the moment. I wanna talk about living in the moment. That's a huge one. And I know this is kind of, this is popular right now, right? It's always so annoying. We'd be like, okay, you gotta live in the moment. You're like, what does that mean? I mean, I'm, all, I'm stressed out, I'm in traffic, my husband's bugging me. I mean, what do you mean live in the moment, you know? <laughs> I know, I mean, I'm always like, but, and I think more than ever, it's like we are sitting here going, oh my gosh, I'm just trying to survive, right? I'm trying to get from A to B. But really, I think what it means is allow yourself to be intentional and mindful about where you are. Like right now, here today, there's nothing more important than what we're doing right now today as women being together. Nothing. So allow yourself to have, it's almost more of a mindfulness of saying, I know that to be true. It's not saying create the impossible and you're zen all the time. None of us are. But allow yourself. Like I have an example. I just went and saw my son just left for college and I told myself on the way to the airport and I made a little announcement with my daughter and my husband. I said, I'm not going to get on my phone this weekend and I'm going to be in the moment. You know, I gave the big, I'm going to be in the moment. You know, and my daughter's like, what does that mean? You know, 
and so I, but sure enough, I put my phone away and I was totally present in the weekend. And you know what's interesting? I could hear the laughter clearer. I could hear, I could almost sense and feel the love as a family. We all missed each other so much. And it allowed me to open up. When I got back on the plane to come home, I realized, you know what, I did it. I was there, I wasn't at work. I wasn't talking to a store manager. I wasn't talking to social media director. I was with them. And so it's just something to remember. We're not gonna be perfect at it, so I'm not sitting here trying to preach that. I don't know, we're not preaching perfectionism, let it go. So the other thing is celebrate the small wins. You know, in our family, celebrating the small things is essential. When you are in a family with somebody with differences or challenges and everything comes harder for them, we're almost forced as a family to look at things in a very new way. So when I say celebrate the small wins, I'm not talking about, you know, I got a raise or a promotion today. I'm talking about I got to work on time. You know, I, yeah, yeah, we have to, you know, I'm, I'm talking about I didn't snap at my kids today. You know, I ate a little bit healthier today. I only had one glass of wine instead of two, you know, whatever it is. And so you've got to celebrate. Because as humans, we're so biased, and I just wanted to point this out, towards the negativity, you know, the negativity bias. You know, there's science to prove this, that we, our brains are still programmed towards protecting ourselves from these immense stressors out there, but ultimately, all that does is train the brain to focus on the challenge, to focus on what went wrong today, but if you really are able to look back, you can look at your day, um, probably is, you know, an even amount of stuff went right that went, then went wrong. But we're so trained towards the negative, which is a challenge for all of us. And then, you know, my last one, progress, not perfection. I mean, I can't really say enough that we have to know that every single day is progress. And we have to let go of the mom guilt. I mean, I don't know how many of us out there are mothers, but it just sits on us like a cloak that we never quite feel like we're doing it right. And I have a quote I want to share with you in the book that I think, you know, somehow I think kind of, I don't know, wraps up the idea of what it feels like being a mother. Being a mother doesn't suddenly require perfection. If anything, it requires humanity. Modeling for our kids that not everything is always picture perfect, but that doesn't mean it's not awesome, or shall I say, good enough. So I want to also just say to you guys, these last sort of mantras, my mantras, instead of the, the credos that we're taught out in society are, we shouldn't be so hard on ourselves for accepting that there's only so much we can do. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to have it all. We don't need to do everything all at the same time. It's fine if we only have room for a few things in our life at certain times. And just remember, there's never only one right way. There's only your right way. Thank you so much.